Scotland's. Um, I would say Bram is a real thought leader on the social dimensions of the conservation movement, um, including the very topical issue that a lot of us are thinking about, which is how social media, whether on the political right or left, is shaping conservation agendas and to whose benefit. And one of the things I really like about Bram's work is, is that um, although it does an excellent job of, of critiquing um, existing approaches, it also explores in a very creative way sort of radical alternatives for rethinking how we can have more equitable approaches to socio-environmental transformation. So without further ado, I'll hand over the um, stage to Bram to uh, share with us uh, I guess a teaser for his new book. Super. Well, thanks so much. Um, first, uh, Connie uh, Yetweiner and uh, and Jane also for uh, for the introduction and for for organizing this. I'm, I'm really excited. Uh, this is my first official yeah book talk on on the book that's coming out uh, very soon with the University of California Press, uh, modestly entitled uh, "The Truth About Nature." environmentalism in the era of post-truth politics and platform capitalism. And um, yeah, I'm just gonna give a, a bit of an overview of some of the key elements of the book and then uh, very much look forward to, uh, to the discussion. So I wanna start with um, the, the basic problem that, that Connie just also sort of laid out. And then of course is, is how to deal with environmental crisis in an age of, uh, of post-truth. Or how to deal with you know crisis you know more generally you know that requires some type of you know realism some kind of acknowledgement or of some kind of reality outside of one's own construction and or um, uh, reality um, uh, or one's own alternative facts in order to come to something uh, a little bit more meaningful um, and I want to play this uh, this clip from. Uh, Conservation International, which I think does a pretty good job to sort of get you uh, into kind of the mindset of the sort of environmental movement, conservation movement in relation to this. So I, I hope this, uh, this works um, and you can all hear the sound. Today's greatest threat is not climate change, not pollution, not famine, flood or fire. It's that we've got people in charge of important shit who don't believe in science. So what are we at Conservation International going to do? We're working to change the conversation around nature. We're focusing on jobs and livelihoods and security. It's not about animals and trees and icebergs. It's about the ability of a community to survive. It's about your child what you're putting in your body, your future. We'll help equip communities and businesses to lead. Show them it's in their own self-interest to protect nature. We'll give people the tools they need to change their world. There is a new generation of leaders. I have a thought for them. Go for it. All of Stick with them. If we don't stop the destruction of nature, nothing else will matter. Simple as that. All right. Well, besides this free advertisement for uh, for Conservation International, I mean the important part, of course, was the was the first part. You know that there are people in port of important uh, shit who don't believe in science. You know, the, spoken in a way that that you literally can't miss. You know that this, of course, is one of the the key issues and key problems of um, of our time. But clearly, it's not just environmental crises. Um, you know, currently we're meeting in this particular way because of uh, the COVID nineteen uh, Corona crisis, um, whereby very similar things uh, are at stake, of course, right? And here. Uh, quite uh, uh, soon into the pandemic, researchers from the University of, uh, of Southern California actually promoted, you know, a new sort of approach to science learning, you know, that according to them aims to uh, combat rampant misinformation on subjects like the coronavirus and climate change. 
right? So it's, it's of course, you know, not just environmental crises um, that relate to this. So one of the solutions, I mean, Conservation International came up with a, with a lot of solutions, of course, but one of the key solutions uh, in all of this, right, uh, in relation to the post-truth uh, era is about sharing nature online, sharing the truth about nature online. And indeed, many environmentalists feel that, you know, quote from the natureneedshalf.org website, quote, they have a duty to speak frankly about the clear implications of the science. And we've seen a lot of people do exactly that, using all kinds of hashtags and all, in all kinds of ways. So here again, just two, two examples. Again, Conservation International stating that one of the best ways to fight hashtag wildlife trafficking is through education. Share these hashtag facts of wildlife now, right? And you're encouraged, of course, to, to, to share these online. And I thought this, this tweet, when I saw it uh, by uh, Peter Kalmus, uh, quite a, fam a familiar uh, climate scientist, was absolutely fantastic in terms of, you know, what I'm trying to get across. Uh, in response to another message, he says, climate truth, though, everyone, time to speak hashtag climate truth. If you have hashtag climate truth, you've got to share it without mincing any words or worrying about messaging. Just express that truth as clearly and accurately as you can, like a sculptor chiseling the truth out of rock. Now, that, wow, I couldn't say it like that. Um, absolutely fantastic. So for those online who have hashtag climate truth, you know, you, you know what to do. You need to express it and, and share it. Another very famous example, of course, that we that we all know, and perhaps here people from Extinction Rebellion are uh, uh, are on the call, is um, again, you know, they are very clearly stating there is this emergency, life on Earth is in crisis, and they have three principal demands. The first of which is tell the truth. Right? Governments must tell the truth by declaring a climate and ecological emergency, working with other institutions to communicate the urgency for change. And many more examples, of course, can be mentioned. Um, but you may be wondering, like the truth about nature, you know, what 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 is that all about? And uh, isn't that a bit of a weird title for a book, especially by uh, somebody who you know calls himself a critical social scientist or political ecologist? Um, but I use the term in quite a broad, very broad, generic, generic way. Right? Namely that according to most ecologists and conservation biologists, nature is not doing very well, but can be saved through appropriate evidence-based action. And I want to be actually very clear right from the start, and I, I state this in the book as well, and it's something I've, 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 I've worked through myself. Um, and I think I've always believed this, but maybe I've not been as explicit, is that I, I too believe that the environmental predicament we're in is indeed rather dire. Right? And that indeed there is truth uh, in that. And I think that that's really important to, to, to state uh, right from the get-go, exactly what that means I will, I'll be talking about in quite some, quite some detail. And for sure, you know, it doesn't mean right, that you know, the environmental predicament translates into some kind of you know, the, the truth about nature you know, in any straightforward uh, manner. Um, but to make it even more complicated, um, right in social sciences, the whole idea of truth, or actually stating truth in in kind of this open, sort of <laughs> straightforward kind of way, might be seen as quite suspicious. Right? Truth? What truth? You mean truth? You know, in between quotation marks, because clearly and obviously this is this is a construction, right? Um, and this has been going on for, for, for a very long time, but perhaps Bruno Latour is, of course, one of the people that has really sort of hammered this point home, stating in 1988 already that in, in discursive contests, the word truth adds only a little supplement to a trial of strength. So basically, conflicts, you know, even epistemic conflicts are, you know, forms of power, trials of strength. And this, this, this random word just adds a little supplement to that, you know, to, to kind of strengthen one side or the other. And a general social science mission, I guess, you know, not for everybody, but very generically, 
you know, has been and actually has been like that for a long time before, is to deconstruct ideas about truth so as to reveal the power relations that truth discourses inevitably contain and try to hide. Um, and clearly, this is super important, right? This is really, really important. And I don't want to dismiss that in any way. But still, you know, I think we've come to a point in time where we need to rethink this sort of general uh, critical social science mission because of two reasons. First of all, what if there is truth to the environmental crisis? And what if ignoring truth is dangerous? It's a very generic question again. But I think if you pose it this generically, um, you may get to different answers. Secondly, you know, the emergence of post-truth. Uh, clearly, you know, you know, it's, it's important in terms of really you know, coming or, or really having to come to terms with what truth then actually really means and whether, you know, this kind of social science mission or, or sort of the increasingly automatic, you know, way in which we look at any idea of truth as something that needs to be deconstructed uh, needs to be rethought because it actually plays in the hands of, of post-truth, which in my understanding is seen as an expression of contemporary forms uh, of power. Uh, so confronting this kind of power means finding ways to make truth productive. And how to do that is something that I will explain in the first part, uh, first part of, the, of the talk and of the book. But before I get there, I just want to sort of clarify the, sort of the purpose of what I'm trying to do in the book and the main arguments, just to give those away uh, immediately. And that also sort of indicates the structure uh, of, my, of my talk. So, Every section, basically, except perhaps for the first, uh, really starts with this idea that the book aims to follow environmental actors employing digital means to save nature in the era of post-truth politics and platform capitalism and the consequences of that. Um, so, you know, as this is seen as, as, as an important way to tackle, uh, to tackle post-truth, you know, to actually combat you know, uh, misinformation, uh, as we also saw around the COVID crisis, um, you know, this has important you know, means uh, or consequences on different levels. And these three levels basically form the, the, the core structure of the book. First of all, uh, on a meta-theoretical level, so I'm, trying to, I'm gonna try to sort of lay out my meta-theoretical bearings. And here the, the key sort of issue is to connect more structural or solid forms of knowledge and more shifting uneven forms of, of knowledge or reality, if you want to want to use that term. And the central argument there is to always be critical about truth as power, right? So the, the standard Foucauldian argument, if you will, but at the same time, always aim to speak truth to power, right? The two have to go hand in hand, right? The social science mission that I talked about is mainly the first, but we should start to realize that we need to do both at the same time in different ways, in new ways, and we should try out new ways. Second, right, other types of power uh, is, you know, for me, uh, very much importantly located on, on, on the level of political economy, uh, particularly in relation to you know, contemporary sort of platform capitalism or the recent conjoining of capitalist power and online social media platforms, right? as we increasingly use social media platforms to share our messages, to share our lives, to share almost anything, uh, and I think you know, everybody knows this by now, right? We're getting ourselves caught up into quite a new sort of system of power with very recognizable, you know, forms that, that, that we know. And here the overall argument is that the strategy of sharing the truth about nature online is problematic and even ultimately contradictory with major consequences for truths uh, and nature. And I will uh, explain that in the second part of the talk. Um, but I don't want to leave it on that kind of really abstract plane. Um, the third part of the book actually goes into much more sort of messy empirics uh, on the ground, mainly in Southern Africa, where I've done a lot of my, my work. And that focuses on cases of conservation action using social media to actually act on the truth about nature in very specific you know, circumstances or areas or in relation to specific ecological problems. So one chapter is, for example, in the Kruger National Park. There's another chapter on the rhino poaching crisis. 
uh, and others. And the key, key argument I want to make here is that actors in conservation, environmental actors, are no dupes of these forms of power, right? They actively use these different forms uh, or they use different forms of politics to mediate platform power. Right? And these in turn are also highly influenced by other determinants like race, class, gender, age, uh, etc. So that's the structure of the of the talk. Um, like I won't go into too many um, uh, details. Uh, again, if you're interested, we can we can have that discussion. And the rest, of course, is uh, is hopefully uh, all in the book. So starting with um, the first, the meta theoretical directions, and I've titled this uh, truth tensions. So this idea of truth tensions plays a really important part, you know, of the book. And this, I mean, like. Any book uh, you know, takes quite a long time to, to think through. And this took for me the, the absolute longest to really sort of come, come to terms with my empirical material on the ground in Southern Africa and, and, and in some way with, with the more political economy of platforms behind it. And these meta theoretical arguments around truth tensions are really meant to help connect those two, uh, those two sort of uh, realms or, or levels, if you will. So it's both a meta -the theoretical argument, but also a methodology and ultimately also a politics going forward. So let me try to uh, explain that. So again, the meta theoretical argument that I just that I just outlined is that we need to always be critical of any truth claim and the powers behind them, whilst at the same time continue to search for truth. Why is that the case? Because this confronts the basic problem that if truth is only power, which is kind of what Latour, of course, is, is, is aiming at, issues could only ever be settled through truth wars, whereby organizing power and organizing counter power is ultimately the only thing that matters, right? It's ultimately the only thing that, that, that is important and that will trump any type of understanding about issues. And I've put here in the, in the slide, uh, uh, I think many of you like myself have been glued to, to CNN for way too many hours, but of course the US election I think is a key sort of example uh, example here or illustration right whereby certain parties actually sort of try to make a point that 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 certain form of understanding right is, is important and, and 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 kind of other parties particularly of course the trump uh, <laughs> the trump camp you know it's just about literally naked you know power it's about truth wars and whatever you make of that doesn't matter as long as you win um and that that, that, that is problematic i think we all uh, we can all see sort of uh, playing out in daily life uh, on cnn every every single day um it is also as i said or hinted at sort of a methodological um sort of tool uh, for me in the book namely that 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 this kind of you know epistemological idea of truth tensions allows for the different statuses of the term in different times, spaces, and in relation to different objectives uh, and aims. So it allows me to, and, and I know that this is integrated, and I know that, that, that this is, you know, in any reality, of course, much more, much more mixed and hybrid. But at the same time, it, it, for me, it really helped me to see how more structural forms of political economic power relate to the very messy empirics of daily life and vice, uh, vice versa. Lastly, and this for me became also really crucial later on, it's actually, it, it, it became sort of my political drive in, in, in a certain sense, namely that it helps me provide direction in the tension ridden space between very more solid and more shifting forms of knowledge and how they, how they interact in order to, to, to in, in one way or another, um, keep bringing them together, but also find a way for, for, for action and politics moving, moving forward. Uh, so basically, I build on Proctor's argument here, who argues that we should, uh, and this is in relation to the construction of nature debates that, that, that were raging 20 years ago, uh, in relation to how nature is constructed. And he argues that we should accept the paradoxical truths that nature is, so to speak, both autonomous and socially constructed, that our knowledge of nature speaks to both secure objectivity and slippery subjectivity, and that our caring for nature is based on values fully arising from our particular and hence limited perspectives, 
yet also fully aspiring to some claim of universality. That in short, we must all found our environmental ethics in a dual spirit of confidence and humility with one leg standing surely on solid rock and the other perched tentatively on, on, on shifting sands. I, I find this an incredible quote and I've, I've been using it a lot since uh, in terms of the, in the book. And my argument here is that perhaps what goes for nature actually also goes for, for, for truth, right? To accept the paradoxical truths that truth, you know, itself, so to speak, is both autonomous and socially constructed at the same time, that it's slippery and objective at, you know, at the same time. And that we should try to find a way to always merge the two at the same time, right? So I argue that this, this tension between solid rock and shifting sand is where we actually may search for truth, um, not in order necessarily to find it, but in order to make it productive. And this is really key for me. So I'm not saying that, you know, somehow, certainly not that I have any truth by far from it. Uh, I think the world doesn't need, you know, uh, white males uh, saying that they have the truth uh, in this day and age for sure. And, maybe, and certainly also not in the past or in the future. Um, so that's that's kind of ridiculous for me. But I, you know, my, my argument really is that the search for truth in all kinds of ways can help to make the term productive. So how to do that? How to make truth productive? Well, by speaking it to power. And this, of course, is a, an old you know, rallying cry um, of, of, of critical uh, social thinking and critical theory more generally. But how to do that? Well, one way in, that I sort of explore in the book is by separating facts from, from truth. Um, or heeding the difference between speaking fact to power and speaking truth to power. Now, speaking fact to power doesn't, doesn't make sense, right? Speaking truth to power for many of us makes intuitive sense in terms of that it's quite a familiar slogan that we know, we've, we've heard, um, uh, you know, this. I, I don't hear it all so much anymore. And again, that's why my book tries to perhaps sort of push for, for all of us to start speaking truth to power and say that we want to speak truth to power more. Um, but sure, certainly none of us say that we would be speaking fact to power. And what is, why is that? It's because, you know, because of the, the particular way in which truth is indeed different from facts. Uh, facts, and I mean, we can, uh, I, I, bear, uh, I work um, here, uh, I'll build my work here on, the, on Mary Poovey's brilliant uh, book, um, uh, a social history of, of the modern fact, um, or a history of the modern fact. And um, from her, this is not exactly the way she does it, but, but based on her work and, and, and other work in, in, in science and technology studies, the way I separate it is that, you know, truth actually includes history, context and positionality. And I really sort of do that based on Arendt, Hannah Arendt's work and Hannah Arendt's ideas about uh, understanding. So this never stops. This, this, this you know, this, this begin, literally says, you know, understanding starts with birth and ends with death. It, it, you never come to a full, you know, blown, you know, situation moment where, where, where you have all understanding, right? It is a process. It is a continuous process. And so for me is, is truth because, um, right, facts are things that may be true, right? outside of history, outside of context, and outside of different positionalities. And so, so they come to matter in very different ways, right? And, and, and for me, the term, you know, the relationship to, to, to coming to matter and indeed meaning giving is absolutely uh, critical, right? So data are unitary little facts of knowledge, and I will come back to that, Underst of a knowledge, right? Already tries to bring in the why question about why data come together in the ways they are. And our ancient understanding is the next step. It provides meaning to knowledge. And this is where I think truth plays an important role in how it's different uh, from facts and why we come to this meta theoretical conclusion of the need to always be critical about truth as power and always aim to speak uh, truth to power. Because in doing so, we need to always include history, context and positionality and still say something that is a little bit more than just power, you know, 
contravening power, organizing contravening power. So the next question is what power should this truth now be confronting, right? And of course, speaking truth to power happens in all kinds of different contexts, but, but here in terms of, you know, the, the post-truth conundrum that I'm centrally concerned with, it's about, you know, confronting this relation between platforms post-truth and power. And that is the second part of my, uh, my talk. So um, just as a introduction here, uh, again, I start with the idea of sharing nature online. Right? And again, this, uh, I think, doesn't need to be repeated, has become truly popular. And many conservationists not just, you know, do this a lot, but they see this really as a game changer. So Dex Kotze, a famous uh, South African conservationist, uh, conservationist literally says that never before did the tools exist so effortlessly to so effortlessly convey messages to different parts of the world at the click of a button. You know, all these, you know, platforms have, you know, millions of users, you know, Facebook over a billion. And so a conscientious digital conservation movement is required against, you know, amongst all different cultures and social media platforms to initiate a paradigm shift in human behavior to save wildlife species uh, from extinction. Now, this itself, of course, um, you know, happens in all kinds of creative ways. A couple of uh, interesting ones that I highlight in the book are this one, uh, hashtag endangered emoji. So if you uh, tweet certain things, you can uh, tweet endangered emojis together with them. And for everyone, donate 10 cents to WWF and they will save, uh, save these animals for you. Um, on Snapchat, you can use these, um, these uh, pictures uh, with the text, don't let this me, uh, be my hashtag last selfie, right? Um, to make use of the kind of medium here. It was praised because here the medium was the message. And of course, you know, on Snapchat pictures, right? Um, uh, self deletes after 10 seconds, I, I believe. So it says here, literally in six seconds, I'll be gone forever, but you can still save my kind hashtag last selfie. So incredi incredibly creative, incredibly uh, original in many ways and, and, and reaching a lot of people. But what it does also is to bring these organizations further into this particular mode of power. Now, uh, this platform power. Now, platform power is nothing, you know, is, is, is a new form of power, but sharing nature on media, of course, isn't. It is a long history. Uh, uh, Goodman and all uh, in do a, do a re uh, really good job to sort of lay out um, some of this, uh, this history. And they argue that some of this, you know, history of the mediation of nature and conservation changed, you know, from the 50s, you know, with BBC and all that, from more truthful representations to increasingly spectacular environmentalisms, as they call it, combining commerce and entertainment to compete with uh, with Rambo and uh, with Jaws and uh, movies, etc., to get people to be hooked on uh, on wild nature. Um, so for me, social media and platforms actually intensify this. They intensify these spectacular environmentalisms, leading to an enormous amount of nature online that I call the digital nature glut. And I refer to this kind of nature as nature 2.0 or co-created natures, customized to individual online citizens, netizens, um, that then ironically are not that very shared at all. Um, there's a lot more to be said about that that I won't do here. The, the key point is that truths and natures in, in very you know, specific ways change in relation to how political economies of media themselves change. Right? So it changed from the radio to the television. And of course, it changed from the, from the television to the internet and with the internet also two more 2.0 forms, uh, forms of mediation. So how does that work? When, what, what does it mean to conserve biodiversity between platforms, uh, post-truth and power? Well, first of all, by doing so, it means that, you know, sharing the truth about nature through the social media, conservation is rapidly embedding itself into a political economy of platform capitalism. Uh, platform capitalism, as several have, have noted, and I build on the work by Nick Shrinisek uh, here, uh, but also uh, Shoshana uh, Zuboff's incredible work on surveillance capitalism um, is basically the current sort of organizational change of global capitalism to make use of the abundance of, uh, of data. So Nick Schnitek actually uh, provides a very useful, and I mentioned it just now already, provides a very useful sort of definition of, of data. 
as information that something happens. And he distinguishes that from knowledge, which is information about why something happened. And of course, the more data platforms can access and record, the more they can link patterns and hence try to predict our behaviors, preferences, and likes through you know, uh, their uh, algorithms. Uh, and this is one of the key elements that, that Zuboff, of course, uh, highlighted that increasingly, you know, it's not just about predicting anymore uh, so that you can, you know, uh, advertise uh, or show advertisements uh, accordingly, uh, but also increasingly nudging people and, and pushing them in particular ways so that you can even, you know, better predict, you know, what they will, uh, what they will need. Uh, the ideal here, according to friends uh, that I have working in, in, the, in the media sector, is um, is that when you get hungry and you know somehow you know all kinds of uh, your telephone is attached to your to your senses you know the um, uh, the platform can already understand what you're craving for and you know soon with a drone there'll be a, a pizza delivered uh, straight to your house your favorite pizza that you that you're then thinking of right so this this would be the ideal form he said of this kind of uh, this kind of prediction. He was very excited about that. <laughs> I don't think I would be ex as excited in the same way. Uh, I certainly would be looking a lot bigger than, than I do now, I, I, would, I would assume. Um, so what are algorithms? Very basically, uh, procedural and calculative decision mechanisms are sets of rules that sort data and process these according to particular modes of reasoning. And so in that way, they estimate knowledge. So they go from data, these little pieces of knowledge, um, oh, wait, here, right? Information that something happened, right? To collect these through algorithms, to bring them together, to understand why these things happen. And the, the better they become at that, the more, you know, they can predict. But still, this knowledge is ultimately for platforms always based on data, right? And because of this, and the fact that it's combined with, for us, very, you know, for us, unknown algorithmic rationalities for reasoning and selection, it becomes a knowledge focused on correlation between keywords, hyperlinks, and other recognizable pieces of data and all our online, uh, online actions. Um, so what emerges, according to uh, Andreevich, quote, is a model in which correlation takes the place of correspondence between symbolic representation and that which is represented, and effective intensity comes to stand in for and displace referential truth, authenticity, and factual evidence. Right? So what we understand and start seeing as important or as, as, as truth or authentic becomes you know, a way in which algorithms connect different things that, that are happening online. And this is how we see our feeds on Twitter and on Facebook and on, on LinkedIn and, and, and all the others. And um, and how we uh, increasingly uh, respond to them and how they respond to, to, to us. Um, and this, according to Annette uh, Rouvois, literally this kind of algorithmic knowledge, she calls literally knowledge without uh, truth. And here you can see kind of, I think, where that, where that leads me, right? So when we come back to, 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 to conservation and nature and environmentalism, it means that why I, I would particularly be interested to save nature actually becomes irrelevant compared to the information that I want to save nature simply by virtue of my online clicking and viewing choices. So the truth or objective fact according to algorithms is the latter. Exactly why I'm into this, you know, doesn't really matter all that much. So likes and shares, sharing nature, sharing the truth about nature, all that are expressions of equivalence interpreted as expressions of affection or support, right? which leads to what I would call um, uh, dead natures without uh, truth. So if this is kind of knowledge you know, without truth, right, these kind of natures also are not meaningful, right? are literally sort of dead natures, you know, uh, data particles on, uh, on, on platforms interpreted as something else. Right? They are literally inanimate pieces of mechanical data that provide clues upon which users may be understood and advertisers may be directed for the platform. Right? And this is crucial because for us, for the users, they're not. Right? They're quite the opposite. They're indeed, because of this process, they become very, very lively. 
right? We see all kinds of things happening with our friends, with our with our with with colleagues, or with you know areas and and species that that we care about, right? One way, one assured way to get you know a lot of likes on Twitter is to post pictures of your cat and and, and other animals doing funny things. So there's there's an acute contradiction here in, in Nature 2.0 more generally, as they become intense, lively spectacles of dead natures without truth, uh, pun intended. So the bigger point that I'm trying to get to here, and then I'm wrapping up the the the, the second part and going to the to the third part, is that sharing the truth about nature online, right, the stuff that I'm I'm starting with the whole time actually stimulates the very forces that undermine the truth about nature by promoting post-truth, by being literally a knowledge you know, beyond, uh, beyond truth. And hence, this changes the way we think about post-truth. Right? It's not something that individuals do or say. It's not like something that, that Trump is post-truth or invented it. No, it's, you know, it, it's, it's much more particular. I, I understand post-truth as a particular expression of power under platform capitalism. Right? So it's very different from lies or bullshit or the way that the Oxford Dictionary, for example, say that it's, it's, that, that it's, that it's about you know, politics that, that focuses on feelings and emotions much more than rational decisions. No, not, not, not those, those kind of things uh, at all. Uh, but they're, it's connected to the functionality of the platform. And that is, uh, that is really cr uh, crucial because online platforms ultimately do not care whether those active and leaving data online are honest lying or bullshitting, right? As long as they can traverse the platform and leave behind data that can be sold and for them to make money uh, with advertisements. Now, clearly th this is changing a bit, you know, even platforms are not completely outside of, um, uh, of any uh, reality um, uh, and or politics, as we can now again very clearly see with the US election, right? Um, and I think this is becoming a meme on Twitter as well, where, where people stamp, you know, an official looking twitter you know warning on, on on a tweet that this this is actually what you're saying is a little bit different from what you know is generally regarded perhaps as as truthful or or the reality outside of your own uh, twitter uh, 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 realm the thing is uh, that sharing nature 2.0 sharing nature and the truth about nature online actually in this process strengthens the power of platform capitalism and hence the power of the capitalist political economy uh, more generally, um, which in and of itself is not very, uh, may not very uh, be very good news for uh, for nature and may be a very dangerous contradiction. So the political economy conclusion that I come to is that sharing truths and natures through platforms actually becomes this dangerous contradiction. On the one hand, it promotes post-truth and hence undermines you know any ability to you know to actually search for truth. And second, it reinforces platform capitalism, which undermines, you know, global natures in a, you know, again, a very broad generic sense um, that, of course, we can we can talk about. But that is ultimately responsible, I think, for the environmental crisis that we're in to begin with. But, and this is a very important but, although this kind of platform capitalism may highly influence right sharing truths and natures and how we deal with conservation and environmentalism it ultimately does not determine them uh, for sure right so uh, this is where i would differ with a lot of new media studies that that would argue that there's no meaningful distinction anymore between the online and the offline realms they're so interconnected through our phones through all kinds of sensors and all that that is really a moot point to start talking about them well, for conservation, clearly, of course, it is because conserving an online elephant is not quite the same as, as, as conserving an offline elephant, right? They want to make a difference in offline realities, not in online realities. Plus, right, all of this, both online and online, right, intersects with many other conditionalities of power, including race, class, gender, and so forth, that are really important to take into account. So in order to do this, in order to gouge this influence more accurately, um, in the book, I study actual sort of politics of conservation in various empirical settings, you know, in the new media uh, and post-truth era. And that brings me to part uh, three of the book and the last part of this, this talk. And this will be the shortest part. Uh, it's the longest part of the book, but I cannot possibly do this justice, so I'm not even going to try. 
Um, I'm just going to try to give a, sh a short flavor and then conclude my, uh, my presentation. So there are four chapters here in the book and they follow, con again, starting with the same thing, they follow conservation actors and conservation actions to try to understand how they employ Nature 2.0 to save offline, uh, offline natures. With the question, you know, how do those interested in doing justice to what they believe is the truth about nature, right? mediate conservation politics in the era of, uh, of platform capitalism, right? And again, this is a generic idea of the truth about nature as I've been sort of explaining it at the beginning, right? That they think that there are issues, that there are problems, right? The poaching or ecosystem degradation, etc. But something can still be done about it. And, and they, 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 they use social media and other digital tools uh, in, that, uh, in that quest. So the chapters actually move from Europe, Netherlands in particular, slowly to, to, to Southern Africa through, uh, through these four chapters, conservation 2.0, 2.0, 2.0, et cetera. And you'll see different types of politics, uh, you know, as the subtitles. So these are the kind of politics that actors actually use to mediate platform power. And again, I won't go into any detail because uh, for lack of time. What is important, first of all, um, is that in that first chapter uh, on conservation 2.0, I look at environmental organizations and how they themselves are grappling with this platform power, right? And one of the key elements in all that is that they are no dupes of this kind of platform power, yet at the same time remain entangled in it and wrestle with it, you know, all the time. Uh, like I think many of us do in daily life. So how they do that, you know, the, is explained in, in, in much more detail. But in one way, they, they, they try to, in the end, come to actual concrete offline you know, interventions you know, to save species. It, that's the ultimate goal of you know, using social media tools to, to do conservation, of course. And here, I look at these kind of interventions, particularly in, in Southern Africa, where a couple of things become noticeable if you take sort of a bigger stance. That first of all, the difference between Western environmentalism, the way that a lot of these, you know, uh, environmental uh, organizations in, in the Netherlands, in the, in the US uh, in other places and on the ground realities is often, uh, often very big. Um, obviously, because, uh, and this is, you know, what, what is important for understanding truth in my perspective, local contexts, histories and positionalities become extremely important, right? Uh, in, in, in actual field situations and become much more intensely acute and, and, and press themselves on you in very different ways than they do when you just tweet something, right? So um, as I work through that in different cases in, uh, in, the, in the chapters, what actually happens when you when you dig into that and you start understanding the, the context, particularly in South Africa, you know, with this apartheid history, um, uh, different positionalities of different groups of people, uh, whites, uh, blacks, uh, colored people, etc. in particular, um, around the conservation equation, around, for example, rhino poaching, around, you know, saving elephants, etc. The whole idea of truth becomes increasingly irrelevant. So as I move through these chapters, any idea of truth seems to actually drown into the importance of dealing with issues around race, dealing with issues around class, dealing with issues around, uh, around gender. Which leads me um, to, the, to the point that um, you may think, you know, we just need to discard that whole notion uh, altogether, all right? Uh, there's such difference and there are all these nuances, you know, create such a different picture to, from, to, to what you see uh, uh, often online, is that those, are, those, those often seem uh, two, two very different worlds. Um, and I show that diversity, you know, particularly in Southern Africa, because that's the region that, that I've done a lot of research in over the, over the years, not, to, not, 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 not uh, necessarily to show that, um, that the way this politics works out, the way that that is all, you know, that that, that is in any way similar or or the same as um, uh, as as one would expect, you know, in, in in other places, right? So again, you need to you need to really sort of, I think, understand the region and understand 
the histories and, and people in order to really do that justice. So you would get a very different picture if you would do studies in Latin America, if you would do it in, in North America, in the UK, in Oxford, etc. Et, et um, so the whole, the whole thing is that going into this detail makes all of it incredibly different from you know what you would what you what you uh, what you would have expected and that there again to, to again reiterate the point that i already made right that there is no longer any clear idea about the truth or a truth about nature right that interpretation context and exceptions are crucial in understanding the environmental crisis in particular places and how different actors respond to this uh, and why and how they devise different forms of politics to deal with this structural platform power in actual uh, real life um, real life spaces. Um, so if that is the case, right, and if the, the the difference of talking about Southern Africa, right, really really matters, right, for example, in relation to other places, you know, where you could also say, yeah, I mean, tweeting from Europe or conservation, uh, you know, with conservation organizations again, makes it, makes it completely different when you think about issues in Brazil or wherever in Indonesia in relation to palm oil, et cetera. Why then talk about truth, right? In, in, in that broad sense, what, what does it matter, right? After this part, can we and should we still conserve any idea of truth when we dig so deeply into these positionalities, contexts and histories, right? Especially about something so contested as nature. And here's where I conclude the book by saying that exactly because of that, my answer is yes, right? Especially by doing justice to these differences and these nuances, right? All of this does not necessarily diminish the truthfulness of our environmental predicament. And following Harry Frankfurt, Frankfurt who wrote this famous little book about bullshit, um, and who later came to, came to, the, came to uh, the conclusion that, right, if, if I actually talk about bullshit, I also need to talk about truth. And he says, Again, and I reiterate this point that you know we should not be indifferent to, to, to truth, which is dangerous. But at the same time, as I've tried to stress, right, truth means nothing outside of this context, history, and positionality. But perhaps this is then exactly the point, right? It's precisely by interrogating the details of environmental crisis in specific places and the exceptions to or different interpretations of this truth that we should come to a deeper appreciation of its importance and a more realistic idea about how to address, share, and conserve any idea of the truth about nature. So what do I mean with that? It means fundamentally, again, and this is where I come back to, to, to those truth tensions. It means fundamentally placing ourselves, you know, on the one hand on solid rock and on the other hand on shifting sand. Solid rock meaning here that the use of nature 2.0 to save offline natures, right, actually leads to a fundamental contradictions. It not only undermines the truth about nature, right, but actually reinforces uneven capitalist development uh, patterns that are responsible for the environmental crisis in the first place. And we wouldn't understand that unless we let go of those, those differences on the ground, of those nuanced you know, contexts and histories, and actually look at the more solid sort of form of power under political economy. But at the same time, we have to put the other, you know, put, you know, on shifting sand, right? The messy, ambiguous empirics of the interpretations, exceptions, and context around truths and natures that conservation actors mediate through social media to save nature. And it's only when you can do the two together, I think you would come to a bigger under, uh, understanding of what we're currently uh, up against. And this is, you know, where this meta-theoretical tension in a sort of meta metaphysical space, you know, about truth tensions becomes the basis for a material politics of, uh, of, of truth tensions. So here I come to the politics uh, in the end. And these are three types of politics. First, it, 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 it's, it's a politics of knowledge, right? So to, to deal with these two, these two different levels, you need to embrace truth tensions. You can't just rely on on, on truth wars, on just counter, uh, counterintuitive power, right? You need to also um, work towards understanding, as Arendt would say, right? You need to use data to build forms of knowledge and then to give it meaning through doing justice to actual people, to actual you know, uh, histories and contexts uh, in, in particular places. 
And this is what Arendt talks about as understanding. And she says, understanding precedes and succeeds knowledge. Preliminary understanding, which is at the basis of all knowledge, and true understanding, which transcends it, have this in common. They make knowledge meaningful. And meaningful knowledge and, and making life meaningful and making these, that is the key, I think, for a politics of knowledge going forward. It's also a politics of ecology, right? It's an agonistic politics that embraces, you know, solid rock and shifting sands, whereby certain eco ecological, you know, elements can perhaps be more easily accepted than others are indeed constructions that need to be fully, uh, fully recognized. So here I build on, on, on Chantal Mouffe's uh, work. And finally, it's a politics of power, right? Both of these politics of knowledge, politics of ecology should again be focused on speaking truth to power, right? Now, how to do this? And this is about making truth productive. It's about understanding and transcending power at the same time. It's about heeding Foucault, right? That indeed power, um, uh, truth is and is always power, but it also transcends that, that it's also at the same time more than power uh, at the same time. And, and, and this is, I think, ultimately captured by this, by this idea of truth tensions. That for me is the basis to move from increasingly meaningless, literally meaningless platform capitalism to building meaningful post-capitalist uh, platforms. In another work, uh, uh, and this is where actually uh, with Rob Fletcher, we've been trying to do this through building something that we call convivial conservation as sort of a meaningful post-capitalist conservation platform. But that's a whole other discussion. For now, uh, this is the intervention I'm gonna make with this particular book. So uh, I thank you for your, uh, for your attention. Thank you, Bram. Um, excellent, very provocative. I imagine there'll be um, some interesting responses, um, particularly uh, taking on something that's um, quite popular right now, um, use of social media to um, raise money and, and support conservation causes. So I think we're a really mixed audience with different experiences. Um, if you have questions, maybe the easiest way to proceed is to um, put something in the chat um, and then uh, I can either read it out loud if you prefer or um, call on you to, uh, to ask yourself and turn on your camera if you like. Um, so yeah, feel free to just uh, put things in the chat boxes I, I don't see anything yet, but somebody point out if I'm missing something. So um, I, there are just so many questions that I could ask. I, I can start with um, one based off of the last thing you just said, um, because I think, um, you know, and for lots of very convincing reasons, um, you have argued that uh, this platform um, activism is a very dangerous thing. Um, and yet there are alternatives. And you said something about um, convivial, um, convivial conservation um, and what that would look like that would be different from um, the strategies that are, are we're talking about now in terms of platform um, conservation. So maybe say a few words about that if you could. Yeah. Oh, it's also the, it's the same question that E.J. Milner has. <laughs> okay, very good. Right. So, Seriously. I mean, this is something that I, I could spend a lot of time on, which I, which I won't. Um, for us, what is absolutely key in terms of convivial conservation is, is two basic things um, that hark back to bigger histories and discussions around conservation. First of all, to move beyond the nature culture dichotomy, right? To really profoundly accept that people and nature are, are uh, intertwined and hence that pr pr protected areas in that sense are not the way forward ultimately for, for, for conservation. And, and second of all, that it needs to be post, post growth and, and first of all, and, and post capitalism more, more, more fundamentally. So do, those two things, I think, make convivial conservation different from the current conservation paradigms that are, that are, that are out there. And that also means uh, tackling and confronting the power of platform capitalism. So the way that 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 contemporary capitalism, you know, now merges with these online platforms to really build quite dangerous and and and, and destructive forms of uh, forms of power that again we see playing out in the U.S. in in, in real life every day the, uh, now. Um, uh, so that those 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 things are different. Uh, a third element that that is different 
is of course how then you, how then do you deal with um, uh, with with these kind of online online platforms uh, and in one way or another and people are already calling for this you know you have to kind of democratize um, these uh, these platforms uh, and be and, and sort of ultimately in one way or another force these these corporations to to open up about the kind of algorithms uh, and and how they make decisions right currently very much focused on profits you know towards uh, other ways in which they can i think be used because i'm not saying we should get rid of social media altogether i, I think that's that's a moot point because that that won't happen but i do think that the power behind technology is absolutely critical in how you actually uh, uh, think about technology and these kind of platforms going forward and so that for me would be part and parcel of 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 the convivial conservation uh, uh, enterprise Thanks. And um, yeah, maybe there'll be opportunities for other questions to, to elaborate even further with that, that teaser. Um, so there are some other questions showing up here in the chat. Um, one from Mark Hirons. Mark, do you want to ask your question? Um, perhaps directly? Uh, yeah, I can um, ask it. Thanks. Um, that was um, really interesting. I was just wondering with respect to your work on the kind of meta theoretical underpinnings of your approach, how do you see that sitting with respect to kind of ongoing work with of, of kind of the critical realists or critical realism? Is it the same thing or is it different? Well, I, I am a critical realist, yeah. So, <laughs> so, so, yeah. It uh, it comes very, very, uh, very close uh, to you know, sort of more. I want to say standard, but two discussions about critical realism. Okay, great. A absolutely, yeah. Graham, could you maybe elaborate a little bit for the, the non-social scientists what we mean by critical realism? Yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe Mark wants to, to, to add as well. I mean, it's basically a, philosoph a philosophy of knowledge that, um, that looks at quote unquote reality in sort of three different ways, right? That, that you have, you know, sort of a more one level of, of, of a much more sort of constructed reality, right? That, that I refer to as shifting sand. Uh, a, a second one, sort of social, you know, political, economic kind of kind of more deeper reality, and then and then a, a much deeper sort of you know earthly, uh, how would you call it, Mark? A more sort of tectonic reality, where whereby knowledge and 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 the ways we understand it is is actually much much harder, and that the you know the last thing you can't approach directly the last element of reality you can't actually approach directly without going through the first that are much more constructive that are much more shifting so you can only deduce that from you know these these more constructive forms of of, of knowledge and understanding uh, but it doesn't mean that that more solid forms are not are not out there and that you can't perhaps uh, try to approximate those and hence you play with you still play with in in, in productive tension with you know and i try to i try to i try to simplify that with the idea that there is both solid rock and shifting sand at the same time that's maybe the easiest way but maybe mark has a much better way to explain that <laughs> no i'm not sure i do i mean I, my, my understanding in, in kind of basic terms would be that there's kind of uh, a real reality is out there but our understanding of it is always socially constructed, which isn't the same as saying reality itself is, is kind of socially constructed. And I think one of the ideas that I've found interesting in critical realism is this uh, idea of judgmental rationality. So you can kind of, which I think kind of ties into this idea of making knowledge meaningful. So it's possible to make uh, evaluations of different claims to knowledge or different claims to truth, um, rather than just saying all claims are equally valid which kind of extreme social constructions fall into so um yeah uh but obviously you kind of get into some difficulties working kind of in the tensions i guess and the, and the paradoxes that you kind of come across so yeah. kind of thinking through what this means for how you understand the world and kind of generate meaningful political kind of interventions um yeah so i just kind of coming from that perspective myself just wanted to check in on my understanding and making sure that yeah. it kind of definitely had those vibes but you didn't use the term so um yeah also found a kind of a, a, a fruitful way of engaging across disciplines i guess there might be quite a few natural scientists here and i think it can be a nice platform actually for for reaching out and 
um, working across those disciplinary divides. Um, often, yeah, it can be quite difficult to speak into those other disciplines or other approaches to understanding nature. So, yeah. So, so I mean, this is, and maybe it's a bit of a uh, uh, woolly <laughs> and, and complex way to do that, but but certainly this is for me a way to also reach out to my ecologist and, and, and natural science friends, right? In, 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 in many ways, uh, dealing with and studying conservation means in one way or another, this, you know, the, the relationship with people that have a, a very different sort of understanding of, of nature, reality and all that. And to try to, to, to do that justice on both sides is, is, is a tension and is a continuous struggle. Mm. And I think, yeah, we've come to a point where we, we really need to step into the, I mean a lot of people are already doing that so I'm not claiming anything innovative here right I mean this is this is this is a tension that's been been there for for ages um, but it's taking new form right it's taking new form in the particular context of environmental crisis that we currently face and in the particular sort of forms of power right that, that, that we currently see uh, evolving particularly in relation to these platforms and that is what I'm trying to get at Thanks both. Great, great discussion. I see another um, uh, social science um, oriented uh, question next from Quentin Lewis. Do, would you like to um, would you like to ask your question, Quentin? If you're there, I mean, I can also read it out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'll read it out. Um, you can probably see it too, I guess, Bram says it. Could you talk a bit about your link with the tour's critique of matters of fact to matters of concern? Isn't having two feet in different pieces difficult places, sorry, difficult in practice? Shouldn't we focus on re-describing truth by acknowledging the chains of reference to move from the word to facts? This would lead to Stenger's cosmopolitical proposal. I'd be curious to see how you differentiate yourself from this. It's, yeah, um, this might require some explanation for um, wider audience, but your proposal seems uh, very Western centered in a way in, in a way by conserving that hard rock. So is there really a hard rock? Is there really, I guess, um, a reality out there that is the same for everyone? Perhaps way to yeah. also paraphrase that. So, so I don't know Stinger's uh, cosmopolitical approach. So, so, so I can't comment on that. So, so, um, so that's something I would need to, need to, need to get into. But I've certainly tried to distinguish my approach from from Latour's um, in in several ways. I think I I do uh, try to um, put a lot more emphasis on on power than I think he does, um, and uh, the relation between truth uh, truth facts and and power. Um, so I, I often feel, I mean, this is a bit bluntly put, of course, because Latour's work, you know, can be this <laughs> a full full day discussion in and of itself. Um, but that his A and T you know, actor network approach, in a certain sense, is, is rather flat, uh, flat in terms of understanding power and flat in terms of understanding meaning. Um, so coming on the one hand from a more ethnographic, you know, anthropological perspective. And on the other hand, from a from a political science, uh, political economic sort of perspective, I you know I, I do think matters of concern that you know what what he's pointing at is is, is really uh, important, but at the same time we should be able to say something more strongly about the forms of power that that we're currently confronting, and why speaking truth to power is, is so important. That for me would be would be really important. Um, I don't necessarily think that that is. But that 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 is innately Western centered, but I would also not not if other people think that 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 it, it is, I don't think I'm I would be the person to say that 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 it isn't because I am indeed from the Netherlands, and like I said before, I think you know there there, there are issues particularly in the contemporary debates that are really important to 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 consider, um, but even with more indigenous and, and alternative um, ways of looking at the world and ontologies. Um, and these are these are kind of discussions that I have been sort of getting into uh, quite quite a bit. I think in all kinds of ways, including and especially also in relational understanding of the world uh, through kind of yeah, a more relational way of, way of being, um, that a lot of 
those kind of ways of understanding the world also would would consider certain things you know as hard rock <laughs> um, uh, more solid than than others right and and respond to that you know uh, uh, accordingly um, I, I think everybody in their lives you know whether here or in southern africa people that i work with or indigenous peoples uh, do that in, in in multiple ways um how they understand that can be indeed very, very different in their approach, right? And 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 that's something I think yeah, a bigger discussion that's currently going on um, with some real important epistemological you know stakes involved. Um, and yeah, I don't know whether Quentin wants to 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 add to the, to that, but yeah, my take on my take on that, as I try to show, is 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 that I think we should still be able to confront you know, real solid forms of power, including in order to give people's, people space that have other ways of being in the world. Thanks. So let's see, there's, an, there's another um, nice short question from Ryan Wilkie. Does Ryan want to, to deliver it? Uh, sure. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so my question was sort of more, uh, practically oriented. I'm thinking about um, all of these uh, critiques. How should we change the way that we use or think about social media platforms and sharing the truth about nature? How can we uh, more effectively exploit these platforms um, rather than the other way around? So, um... So I mean, it's it's inter it's interesting that that at least in the in the communities that I'm part of, this is not such a big big thing. I mean, there's increasingly sort of critique of sort of platforms, um, right after the Cambridge Analytica scandal and all that. It, it's it's more common knowledge. Uh, I mean, I think I guess many of you have seen the the Netflix film that that recently came out on social media as well, whereby those who were I forgot the name. Um, but it, it was about people that were involved in actually building these these platforms, warning you know people you know generally in the public more generally that what they've actually built is really really dangerous, right and really really destructive. Um, so I think this is becoming more um, widespread, not nearly widespread enough, but it you know I think in in certain circles it, it is becoming more widespread, uh, but in certain more sort of tech circles and, and more artistic. And, and I also see that in, in, in uh, architectural and other circles, you know, like certain communities that actually really combine the technical and the social, right, in, in interesting ways, that they are thinking about alternative forms of, um, um, of using social media, not about, you know, uh, platform corporations, but platform cooper cooperatives, for example. So they are. This is already being experimented with as we speak, and those are the kind of things I'm, I'm talking about. But I think, with as with alternatives more generally, it's it's both about confronting the current kind of platforms that hold a lot of power. I think that needs to happen, and that is happening, but really, really difficult. And at the same time, building alternatives. It, it's it's not either or. It's 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 both. So j just following on that, it sounds like you're you're saying, um, Bram, that that the the platform itself should follow the same sort of principles that it's fighting for, in a sense. Would that be a fair paraphrasing? In terms of a new, you know, different ways of relating, different relation to nature, that the platform needs to be internally consistent. Is that sort of how you're saying? Well, no, I, th I think they are internally consistent in, in, in their goals at, at the moment, right? They, they are consistent in their objective for pursuing all kinds of, you know, modes in which they can make a lot of money out of predicting people's and, and, and actually conducting and, 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 and uh, influencing people's behaviors, right? So there's no politics, as far as I've seen, with the big platforms like Amazon, Google, Facebook, uh, and, and all the rest of it. Uh, to work towards a more sustainable, uh, sustainable planet in, in, in any real and meaningful way. Uh, if you, if you, yeah, so but I mean, I think the way well, how I was hearing what you're saying is that if you know, for those fighting for sustainability, just to, to follow mm -hmm. on Ryan's point, that um, 
you know, that somehow the platform itself, for example, should be sustainable, yeah. however it defines it. Yeah, and that, that it, and it yeah, should, exactly. um, yeah, sorry, yeah. yeah. And not, yeah. not, you know, if manipulation is not considered the value that it wants to forward, then don't yeah. use manipulation to get people to click on, <laughs> yeah. Give yeah, credit card. Exactly. So not just in terms of sustainable, sustainable in terms of the incredible amount of energy it uses, <laughs> for, for example, right, to keep all the algorithms going that enable us to meet it this way, for example, of course, as well. But but also more sustainable in terms of in terms of what they do with this kind of formal power, right? So they say they say they want people to be able to freely express themselves, but in the in the process, as we now all know, we are being nicheified, uh, put into different niches, and when we you know get disconnected from our our our, our fellow you know uh, citizens and, and country women and men etc. Um, in all kinds of insidious ways um and that is what what they do you know really on purpose i mean that that's what these platforms were made to made to do or at least you know what they increasingly were designed to 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 become and that that in one way or another needs to change and it it, it has to start with at least the public knowing what these algorithms do and we don't we don't know those are the best guarded industrial secrets of the 21st century right uh, simply because you know if we knew exactly why and how they would make choices we might look very different at, at them and also see what we are missing in terms of information that we may 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 hold dear thanks so i i noticed um i noticed uh, sabuan you had your um hand up I'm yeah, not sorry. Sure exactly I put it back yeah. it's, hi hi bram it's sebi um i put it back down because ryan basically asked my question um, but I suppose I could ask another question is, um, what about, for example, you know, I'm researching invasive species, so non-charismatic animals, where the debate is much more nuanced and requires a lot more information than a photo or a 10 second video clip. Um, is there a way you can propose forward um, to, to help, you know, effective conservation that, that requires, yeah, more detail than these, these uh, very short, sound or sight bites yeah i mean the way i would answer that question is that 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 here again it comes down to uh, you know the, the the context within which these species need to live and or and or survive and whether and or how they are invasive and and whether invasive means problematic um I think it's, it's indeed part of a big debate at the moment, right? Uh, I mean, Fred Pierce's *The New Wild* and other books, right, uh, have increasingly been making the point that that we shouldn't maybe see them as so negative as 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 a lot of uh, environmental policies have historically seen them. Um, you know, for and especially sort of as practiced in 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 uh, New Zealand and Australia, and all that. So clearly, invasive uh, species, you know, can uh, can have a lot of in, you know, impact on so-called native species um, or original species or indigenous species, etc. Um, but how they do that depends exactly on the context that you know that that you would be looking at. And I don't know what you have in mind, of course. Um, and the interesting thing with 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 these algorithms and with social media is that. Obviously, I mean, you could do a lot on social media to try to communicate that, right? You, you could set up a whole Twitter thread on why, you know, certain forms of context need to be taken into account. Um, uh, but this is an argument that I kind of mentioned, but maybe not all that, you know, clear from the presentation. It becomes harder to actually see those kind of things in and through social media through the sheer volume of knowledge. Right, so we all communicate with the world, but you know the way that we you know, spout out information out there is is is, is, is it, there's simply such an incredible volume that that you can't take into account or take for granted that people actually come then to understand. It will still be maybe a small community that will be invested in this or particularly interested in you know in in all kinds of ways. Um, so what that actually then does in the world, it, you know, it really depends on many other factors uh, and, and is not necessarily helped by the social media, I would say. 
I don't know whether that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Great, thanks. Um, so there's a question here about power from Fiden. Um, Fiden, do you want to um, explain your question? Uh, if my microphone works, I will try. Can you hear me? Barely, a bit quiet. Um, Any better? Yeah. That's better, yeah. Uh, if it doesn't work, uh, just tell me or repeat it after. Sure. Um, first of all, th thanks very much. Uh, um, my question, I was thinking from uh, the point of the presentation that you were saying that speaking truth to power has become less common um, a slogan. And I was thinking that perhaps that's because of a common disillusionment with power. Um, I was reading recently like May 68 and afterwards the globalization movement. I think that's kind of a, a common trajectory. Um, and uh, and I also had the question of like, what is power we speak truth to? Mm -hmm. um, perhaps also because uh, it's against the incentives of power to listen to our truth. That is my so, question. Yeah, so I, I think I think this is a this is a really important question. So so these these more philosophical, mm -hmm. meta theoretical sort of um ideas were really sort of inspired by Foucault's um latest lecture series right Foucault of course is very well known for his theory of power and um and how it relates to to, to truth and there's a very famous quote also about how truth can't be seen outside of power etc but literally in the last section of the of the last lecture series that that, that he gave um he actually also says that 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 if you just leave it to that, it, it's actually limited, and and you, you you know truth can go beyond particular forms of power, um, and in my understanding, what he means with that is exactly your question, right? That we have to be clear about what kind of power we speak to, and this perhaps is is something that that we don't do often because, um, in um, a lot of social theory. Right? The idea that power is dispersed has become quite hegemonic. Right? So power is everywhere and resistance should also be just everywhere. And, and, and that makes it harder to, to really fight against something or the other. Right? We're all part of it. First of all, it's, you know, we're also it. We're also, of course, we're, and, 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 and to, to a good degree, that's also true. But there's also difference. And that's, again, where I think I'm, my understanding is quite different um, from, uh, from Latour's is that you, you can actually pinpoint towards certain forms of structural power and certain actors that are situated more centrally in that. And that, you know, for lack of a better word, you, you can target <laughs> that, 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 that you can actually speak truth to, right? So in this case, you can speak truth to social media platforms, to, 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 to these corporations. And people have been doing that and, and it has had some kind of impact. Right? The fact that, that, that Trump's tweets now have this sticker on them that say, you know, this uh, idea about the election is disputed or false or whatever, is exactly because of that. Because people started literally speaking truth to that kind of, uh, kind of power. So you need, and that's why I said you need to understand and, and study power in that kind of way in order to speak truth to it. And this can be very direct, right? I mean, if you're interested in, for example, issues of race uh, and this is an important part of the, of the book because you know a lot of the work of course is in relation to south africa where conservation and race you form a really problematic you know uh, 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 mix um you you can speak power to whites including yourself <laughs> in in my case and perhaps many of us and 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 confront the kind of power that come with whiteness right in relation to conservation and of course this is currently being done and so but you have to in a certain way be truthful about this right to and, and be truthful first of all about what this power is and by saying that out loud in particular context in particular circumstances it can have a real effect and i think one of the main effects is that that not just power feels confronted like, hey, wait, um, and I think that, I mean, let me find a different way to, to explain this. The difference is this, 
if if some folks in a powerful position feel that you're speaking to power, they will try to resist you. They they will try to somehow resist or co-opt you or or somehow deal with it or feel threatened by it. And that's what speaking truth to power should be doing, right? It should make feel power feel uncomfortable. And people outside of it should recognize something like, hey, wait a minute. This powerful person keeps saying this, but but you know, it, it doesn't correspond with 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 you know reality outside of that person's pur purview in, in, in the in these particular ways. And hence power then also loses legitimacy. And those are really important elements, I think, and why speaking truth to power should should be reinstated in, you know, in in the way that we may have lost uh, over the last 20, 30 years. Thanks. That, that point about legitimacy to me seems to some extent to segue to a similar question from Max, Max Keller, about basically why we can speak to power, but why are they going to listen? They don't want to. Max, do you want to um, do you want to maybe elaborate on that? I'd love to. Um, I'm just kind of like <clears throat> when I hear this kind of speaking truth to power, which, um, you know, is being talked to a lot um, in this kind of post truth era, I think um, Foucault, I, I find that Foucault's um, defense of like that power doesn't know truth to be a little, I don't know, it, it seems big of me to call Foucault naive, but um, that if, if they didn't have an appreciation of truth or reality, I don't know why the those who hold biopolitical power in this in this world would be able to keep it. So because what power who I define my question as states and the capital, those with like power over life, um, they, they have no material interest to mitigate climate change. They have material interest to adapt certainly, but I don't know, I, I haven't seen, and they have known about the risk to themselves personally and the risk to the entire world for about, 40 years now. Mm -hmm. And if speaking truth to power helps, why hasn't it? <laughs> well, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm I, 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 uh, I, I, I didn't mean to come off that harsh. <laughs> no, no, not no, to that, you personally. That, that's totally fine. I mean, I mean, if uh, you know, if you would have an answer to that question, I, I would certainly be very happy because I, I don't think I, I would have that. But but again, I, I think for me, one of the key, I mean, one or two of the key elements in here is first of all, that in critical social thinking, many, but certainly not, not, not all. I mean, there's always been and, and continues to be this, you know, more material tradition, etc. But, but the kind of more post-Marxian tradition that, that I still myself also hold very dear has lost a lot of ground in that respect. And, and I think, I mean, of course, speaking truth to power also really comes from this kind of more material, historical material, uh, materialist tradition, right? Um, and they've always been quite clear what they're, what they're targeting. And not, that, that's not necessarily been effective in the way that I think I hear you uh, say I, I'm far from a Marxist scholar, by the way, like very far. Yeah, no, no, that, that, I'm, I'm, <laughs> so. not, I'm not judging in any event, right? Um, and in the book, I, I really try to connect post-Marxian thinking to to Foucauldian thinking and 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 more, you know, uh, constructivist work, but also Hannah Arendt's work, which sits quite uneasily in in in, in all of this. So it, it so I'm also myself quite eclectic, but I do come back, and, and I think that would be the answer to my answer to your question. I do come back to certain forms of solid, very solid political economic power, structural power that can be understood, you know, if you, you know, if you uh, study the history of capitalism, right? And indeed, you're right that some in power, I, I, I always joke to my students, you know, people in power, you know, they hate Marx, but they're actually the biggest Marxists around, right? They, they you know, they, they are you know, they may not say it, but of course they're like Marx because they acknowledge the actual realities of certain things in order to stay in power. Exactly but, as you um, say. 
one of my professors made a joke about the resounding effectiveness of mutual aid amongst the top people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but, but yeah, I, I like that. That's kind of that. That's kind of my con just uh, my concern with the like, uh, like the the the, eff the effects on reality at expense of the time and as the years go by, actual lives, actual goods, actual livelihood are sacrificed. Yeah. To 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 because in it seems in times of extreme global crisis. Uh, capital seems to be more, um, and I, I do talk about, I, I should talk, talk about like institutions of power more than capital because that's what we're talking about because not only capital. Yeah. Uh, they, have a ten, they have a tendency to consolidate power yeah. at, at expense of life. Yeah, yeah. Even, yeah, right? in, e even in the, uh, the face of a most resounding truth. Yeah. I mean, sorry. Um, what just um, just this is a really fascinating conversation. If there's time, we can carry on with that. But I, I noticed um, we are coming towards the end of the session. I was wondering if um, we have a really practical question here from Omar. I wonder if Omar uh, wanted. Was I don't so need long. that. To oh no, <laughs> yeah. To be continued. <laughs> Omar, are you online still? Yeah. Hi there. Hi everyone. Um, and thanks a lot, Bram, for your talk. Yeah, this is just a very quick and utilitarian question, really. Uh, but um. Is that if there's any advice you could give to social media managers and conservation organizations um, yeah. that they could take on from, uh, I guess, some of the insights in your in your book, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So I literally have a whole chapter on social media <laughs> managers oh. in conservation organizations yeah. um, that I couldn't go into into now. So I learned a lot from them, right? Because uh, my first round of interviews was around 2010, 2000, and 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 a lot of them were sort of experimenting. I mean, there weren't any men social media managers i mean it was really funny because when i asked for the people that did social media i was usually saying, well yeah there's this there's a student that did, that does an internship and, and you can ask her or him because yeah they're young they know about this stuff we i mean pfft. three four years later i did another round of interviews completely changed you know so professional social media departments and all this who struggled with some of these things that i have also struggled with right and um, one thing, one one advice, and, and this, you know, for, for me has been, has been a real practical advice, is that in the practicality of dealing with with this kind of form of power, I think they don't appreciate, in fact, how powerful and why this is such a powerful form of 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 of, of power. Okay, that, that's too much power in one sentence, but why, why you know, why? the relation between contemporary capitalism and you know um and platforms have, has, has come together to create this new sort of platform capitalist model and where at some points they would need to draw a line in the sand and say up to here and no further and how they could maybe use that right to to continue the fight on, on different on different fronts a lot of a lot of interviews that i i had ultimately the people still said Yes, but the only way we can reach people, and especially the youth, right, who are going to influence things tomorrow, is through social media because they're all all on there. So we have no choice. We we understand that there's problems, but we have no choice, etc. I think they do have a choice, right? You can put pressure on social media corporations, and things can change because of that. I think conservation organizations should become more aware of this, and they should think about it more. They can invest in alternatives, which are currently being developed. They can also help to do that. I don't see them doing that either a lot. So those are two things I think uh, can be, you know, thought about tomorrow and put into practice the day after. Thanks. Well, yeah, <laughs> excellent point. I think, um, I mean, one, one way of paraphrasing it too is kind of thinking uh, holistically about the, both the means and the ends of what we use um, to, you know, save the environment or whatever our objectives are that, you know, if we use social media, I mean, it, it it's, has its own ethical implications and it can take on the, the tools that we're using can take on a life of their own and, and shape things in ways that we're not necessarily intending. So I think thanks so much, Bram, for, um, let me see if there's any, um, we are coming towards the end, but is there, 
uh, Alexandra Shawson, there may be time for one or two more questions that we can wrap up. Um, maybe Alexandra, do you want to say something quickly? No, I, I, it was just a reflection on on the last point that um, you know I find that a lot of of, of, of practices that that some leading conservation organizations embody, um, including Conservation International, are more designed to fit within a capitalist system rather than transform away from it. Um, so that's that's it. I was just making yeah. a point. I think that's a really important point, uh, Alessandro. Thank, thanks for. Um picking of, of, of putting it out there I think um, and, and one of the ways one of the reasons for this I, I do touch on the book uh, touch on that in the book a little bit is because of the urgency of the environmental crisis right a lot of times I mean some do it very deliberately like the nature conservancy is fully on board with Wall Street and all that and to, to a good degree the other the other big conservation organizations as well but within them are a lot of people that have similar type of discussions and 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 questions and and you know like tensions and issues that 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 we also have, um, but they don't really, yeah, translate that to what they could do otherwise. And I think I think just putting it out there uh, and continue to say that 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 is also a possibility. I think is really important. Yes, thanks. I agree. It's a very important message. Thank you. Thanks. Excellent. Um, excellent points, everybody. And I, I think this is about about the right time for the for the OCTF uh, seminar to come to a close. I mean, I I know I I too could continue talking um, about this for <laughs> indefinitely. Um, thanks a lot to your really provocative talk, Bram. Um, and you've given us a lot of food for thought. And I hope that all of us. Um, we'll continue to discuss these ideas among ourselves and continue to challenge ourselves like this um, going onwards um, and looking forward to someday when we can also meet in person again and continue the conversation. <laughs> yes, please. Yes, please. All right. Thank, thanks very Thank much. You, and, and goodbye, everybody. Thank you for joining. Right. Really, really uh, thing, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, from, from all of us uh, virtually. All right. <laughs> See ya. Good. Onto the pub now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> or whatever equivalent we have. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Right, thanks. Good. Thanks again so much. And uh, Connie, I hope we can be in touch and, and, yes. and chat a little bit more. I would really appreciate that. Yeah. And just a note that we this will go onto YouTube. So we'll have this on one, one video as well. So you know, if anybody wants to. Thank you very up. much. It was really good. Yeah. Thanks so much, everybody. I'm out. I'm over here in BC, it was worth getting up for. Oh, wow. yeah. <laughs> they have another cup of coffee. Yeah. yeah thank you. Great. Well, have a good day then. All right. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. We're starting the weekend on this side. Oh, yeah. yeah right. Well, yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and soon for everyone. Okay. Have a good Cheers, weekend. Bye.